Just another in a recent spike in homeless arrests. 20% arrested this month have been homeless. You get arrested just because you're homeless. The typical long-term chronic homeless person was being put in jail a lot because of small petty crimes, open containers, trespassing, loitering, all those kinds of things. Columbia, South Carolina, another city criminalizing homelessness. Well, where are the homeless people supposed to go? The homeless end up in the criminal justice system because there hasn't been a better alternative. I served three and a half years at the Utah State Prison, so I've been homeless a little over a year now. This morning, I had got out of jail, sat down like this. The officer had pulled up on his motorcycle and told me I was going to jail. This was the same officer who had just taken me to jail not even 24 hours ago. Our homeless need long-term treatment solutions instead of just incarcerations and then put them, put them back in the street. Just because I don't have a car, I don't have a credit card in my pocket or change in my pocket or a home to go to, does not make me a criminal. We did a survey here, it was about $20,000 per person per year on the street because of emergency services costs. Jail time, EMT runs, emergency room visits. And so we realized we were incurring those costs anyway. There's a much more humane and economic way in order to meet their needs. You'd be surprised who's homeless. Most people are homeless. They are running away from problems. They are running away from you know, drug addiction. Got molested when I was a kid, about six years old. Started drinking early age of 13. I couldn't deal with my problems. I've been homeless for the last 20 years. About 10% of the homeless population were chronically homeless. A chronic homeless individual that's been homeless a year or more or four times in three years. A lot of mental health issues, substance abuse issues. We decided to adopt a housing first model. Instead of asking people to change their lives before we gave them housing, we chose to give them housing along with the supportive services and then allow them to change their lives if they wanted to. We can house them for about $7,800 per person per year for case management and rental assistance in a housing unit. 2005, in order to get into housing, you need to be clean, dry, and sober. And if you fell off the wagon, then you lost your housing and case management. Well, we weren't reducing homelessness. In 1998, we got kicked out because I was using drugs. We went back again, it was like a routine for the last 15 years. I mean, it was hard. Having a house is the stable base for everything. If you don't have a stable place to live, that's going to be the biggest crisis on your mind every day when you go to bed. Whereas when you're in your own home, that whole level of stress is taken away. And now you can focus on everything else that you need to focus on in your life. Well, it works because we've come down 72% from our high in 2005. Getting my housing here literally saved my life. Well, they arrested me at least 18 times. I ended up at the detox. The police brought me in there. I was pretty sad, I was shaking hard. But Ed moved me in here. I mean, I had towels up there, clean sheets, pots and pans. He brought me a big box full of canned goods. He said, well, anything you need, call me. And I looked around and I told him, I said, no, Ed, I got it from here. We've been able to show that if you house people properly and correctly, is that it takes them out of the judicial system and the recidivism rate decreases. It's kind of like a security place for me. I know I got a place to stay. This is good, good feeling. If I was still the homeless guy, I would have continued on and drank myself to death at this point. It's my first complete 100% sober year. And it's a good start, I feel, you know, not the end of my program, but it's a good start. The ultimate goal is to eliminate chronic homelessness here in Utah by the year 2015. And the results here prove that that is an achievable goal. The old approach of emergency shelters and transitional housing has been a failure. Housing First has been accepted nationally. This is the key to ending chronic homelessness. The Casper Housing Authority is trying out a system they first saw in Salt Lake City. Staff say they've already seen success stories. 
Now with the Housing First, we're much more successful in getting them housed and out of the criminal justice system and off the street and help them integrate back into society. We're actually moving out today. It means a lot to me to have my family back where we can be by ourselves and it does help you. If you do need to come here, everyone needs a helping hand here and there. It is most cost effective. We can serve more people with the same amount of dollars than if we didn't do this program. But it's also the right thing to do. It just makes sense. I got arrested about 34 times due to drugs. Over and over again. Over and over and over again. I was arrested 14 times for being under the influence of a narcotic. And no one say, this is his 14th time through here, Your Honor, for the same charge. He needs help. What if we tried something different? I've been arrested so many different times. I've had a couple of possession charges. I've had a couple of prostitution charges. I've had a ton of probation violations. I really can't even remember what the first thing I got arrested for. Urban drug addiction has been with us for as long as we've had cities. And so many major social problems come to the criminal justice system to be fixed because there isn't something else out there. But don't ask the criminal justice system to do it all because the only thing we really know how to do is send people to prison. So eventually I started living in a tent and this is kind of my old home. This is what it looks like back here. It was an endless cycle. It was between tent and jail for like seven years. I've probably been booked in and out of King County Jail like 50 times. It hurt to lay down, it hurt to stand up. It was really excruciating. I came to Seattle, I wanted to buy a large amount of Oxycontins. They weren't readily available and everybody kept offering me heroin. I turned it down for four days. Finally, I was so sick. I was puking, I had diarrhea, I was shaking. I felt like I was gonna die. So finally I caved in and I did heroin. My addiction got out of hand and three or four days turned into like nine years. Belton kind of runs between First Avenue and Fourth Avenue almost every other night on the news. There were just like constant arrests happening. It goes on in the open for everyone to see. Two days ago we saw probably 40 dealers. Drug addiction in Belltown is rampant. Police published this photo to show how many they collected in just one week. A few times I honestly tried to just kick on my own, but I got so sick. I was to the point where it was either I have to be on methadone and quit, or I'm gonna die. I asked to speak to the sergeant. I told him nobody's ever given me a chance before. So I'm sitting in this cell and I'm already getting sick. And he comes back and he tells me, for your own good, I hope that you make it to that methadone appointment. There's one thing you have to do for me first, is you have to talk to these people from this new program called the LEAD program, and then you're free. You can leave. I'd never been given a chance before. The approach that we had over the last 35 years or so of just arresting and putting people in prison for having serious addictions, well, we all know intellectually that's not the answer. When we finally sat down and said, well, what we really want to do is have another option for the officer on the street, something other than taking them up to jail. What if you, instead you could take them right to a treatment program? One reason it works is it costs the taxpayers a lot more money for them to be on the streets. It costs a lot more money for police, it costs a lot more money for hospital visits. In the end, it's the humane, financial, smart thing to do. And that's what the LEAD program does. It provides both the relief to the neighborhood, the police will come and respond to open air drug dealing, 
but it also can provide relief and hope to people who have had long-term addiction. Long-term addiction literally changes the chemical makeup of your brain and makes it impossible for you to be anything but an addict. I had everything that I would possibly want. A beautiful wife, two great kids. At one time, I was making up to $185,000 a year. I just loved, I love heroin. I love that feeling. The good times don't last. I've seen tons and tons of people get arrested for it. And I've been stopped and caught with drugs on me a number of times. Personally, I've seen five people overdose and die. I know about 15. The last partner I worked with <laughs> overdosed and died in front of me. It was almost like this is my last chance. I can either wake up the next morning and go into treatment or I can come back here. Officer Willoughby, he actually said, have I had enough? So I answered in the affirmative. And he's like, well, let's see what we can do. Drug use and abuse should primarily be treated as a public health issue. LEAD is a harm reduction program, and if they do choose to be in the LEAD program, they will receive individualized case services, whether it be substance abuse treatment or housing or job training, with an understanding that breaking addiction, which can you know, last for decades, is not going to be an overnight process. So it's really about meeting the client where they are at and trying to help with their basic needs first and then trying to work on substance abuse treatment. It wasn't government telling this person, this is what you need. It was the person who had been struggling with addiction saying, this is what I need to get back on my feet. And through the skillful help of the case managers, we're able to customize a way out for so many people. Most of the services in this city, you get like one shot. They give you all these services, they try to help you, and you test dirty, you're fucked. They, they, will, they will drop you. You know, I've relapsed, so I didn't call them or even go to the lead office for like two weeks. And when I walked in, my caseworker was like, where have you been? And I remember this very clearly. He said, so what, 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 what's next? What do we do next? I think I actually cried. For the first time in over like five years, did not feel like somebody had given up on me. I've been working with Brad just about a year now. And so wherever he's at, um, I'll be there. And I always tell my clients that, like, whether you're doing great, whether you're not doing great, uh, we're going to continue to work together. What makes us different is that, you know, we have a relationship with them. You know, actually hear their story, because a lot of our clients, you know, people don't really care about their story. And so um, respecting them and giving them dignity um, increases the likelihood of change. We can use the power of the law, and not as a blunt instrument, but as a way to nudge people toward an outcome that is better for them, that's better for the community. My life now is amazing. I have been clean for like a year and a half. I'm going to college. I wake up in a house. It's not a tent anymore. 61 days ago, I was homeless, a full on in my addiction. And today, I go to meetings, I'm clean, I've been through a treatment program, and none of that would have happened without Lee. A couple of our detectives that have been working the Belltown area for a long time. They were just saying how now it is like 90% different as far as like very few people out compared to what it was two, three, four years ago before LEAD. The LEAD program is now expanding from Belltown throughout the downtown core and into Chinatown. We have a lot of people in need. So we have the resources now to go out and individually work with them. It's also been operating in Skyway and has now been replicated in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Do you want the same old, same old with the same results? <laughs> or do you want something that works? It's working here in Seattle. I think it could work anywhere. We're happy to be the example that shows that harm reduction, working hand in hand with law enforcement, can take us into uh, a new approach to drug crimes. And, and I think our nation you know, desperately needs that. one of several police shootings involving people with mental illness. 18-year-old Keith Bidell struggled with schizophrenia. He wasn't violent, and all they wanted was help getting him to treatment. Seconds later, the officer shot and killed him. They murdered our son for no reason. Another disturbing video that raises questions about the treatment of the mentally ill behind bars. He would hear voices. The extraction team restrained him. Minutes later, the 33-year-old was dead. 
jails are the number one mental health facilities across the country. They house more mentally ill person versus any hospital, any psych facilities, any anything. They're patients, not prisoners. Mental illness is the only disease that when you're in a crisis, the cops are called. If you're having a heart attack, you don't call the police. People with mental illness are being criminalized instead of being provided treatment. These kind of jails and law enforcement, that's a public safety net. That's where you end up. There has to be some sort of solution, some sort of help for people who are suffering from mental illness and become involved with the police. Jeff was the youngest of our four. He was finally diagnosed a paranoid schizophrenic when he was totally out of control and very frightening. I would have to call the police on him. They didn't know what to do. I would get calls all the time when I was on patrol for a person who was in a mental health crisis. I had no clue how to handle it. And I would just keep getting the repeat calls every couple days or every week to the same house, the same person. And I just accepted it that, well, oh, this person's just going to be a repeat caller. We decided very early on that we needed to address folks that were nonviolent misdemeanor offenders that were truly being put in jail because of their illness. We knew that it was law enforcement that were first responders and that they would be the ones that would be in contact with individuals in crisis. So we decided what we would do first is train law enforcement officers in the 40-hour crisis intervention training. So they're trained to recognize mental illness. When they come up on somebody that's got this kind of strange behavior, they're not using their command voice and the command presence like they're taught in the academy. They realize right away that this person has a problem. We brought together a bunch of law enforcement officers from the sheriff in the San Antonio Police Department and every one of them didn't want to be there. I heard things like, I'm a cop, I'm not a social worker, I don't believe in these hug-a-thug programs, and this is a bunch of BS. Before I went through the 40-hour CIT training myself, I didn't have the resources on how to handle a mental illness. Well now, it's way different. You know, I have confidence that when I go into someone's home, if they are experiencing some type of, you know, mental health crisis, that I can get them to the right facility and then I may never hear from them again. I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a friend, I'm a voter, I'm a volunteer, I'm all these people. I contribute to my community and I have a mental illness. My diagnosis is major depression with psychotic features, dissociative identity disorder, and panic disorders. I've done the presentations to CIT training. And I tell them, I want to be treated the way you want your mother to be treated if she was ever diagnosed with a mental illness. If I'm in a crisis, you know, I'm having a crisis and I don't, I, I don't understand what's going on around me. Don't do it! Don't do it! In incidents with people who have mental health issues, it's unfortunate to see the ones that result in the use of deadly force where an officer didn't have CIT training and possibly armed with that kind of information, that kind of training, outcomes may have been different. I never knew each morning when I got up what I might find. He began to talk about a fire in the garage. So I thought, would he, without knowing what he's doing, start a fire? How much danger is he in and how much danger am I in? So I called the police and I said, I'm terribly frightened. When they arrived, I introduced them to Jeff. And in this case, they came in plain clothing. They weren't in police uniforms. Now they could have handcuffed him, I guess, and pulled him out, but they are taught how different that person is that they're dealing with. So they began to talk to Jeff. If they can get the person that's ill to, in their own mind, they're cooperating, it's far less violent, it's better for the patient, and certainly it's better for our police. When nonviolent people go to jail with mental illness, they say it's three or four times longer than a violent offender. But if, when they get released, if they're not hooked up into treatment, 
they're going to be right back in. There are so many people in their emergency rooms who shouldn't be there. The previous police chief here has actually kept data on how long his officers were spending in the emergency rooms waiting for psych evals and medical clearance, eight to 14 hours. He spent $600,000 a year in overtime. Now here at the Restoration Center, the law enforcement officers are in and out within 15 minutes. What we have here at the Restoration Center is services patients who are in crisis. It's either walk in or brought in here by a CIT. They recognize the patient's in crisis. They're not truly suicidal. They don't really want to hurt somebody. They just need help. There are about 18,000 people a year who are brought mainly by law enforcement officers to this restoration center who used to go to jail or emergency rooms or put back on the street. If you're a taxpayer and really don't know a lot about mental illness, the fact that the public's a lot safer when these people get treated and the taxpayer saves a ton of money. Over the last uh, five years, we've saved about $50 million in taxpayers' dollars. But we want everyone trained because of the potential daily that someone's going to come across someone who's in crisis. It's not a matter of if, uh, it's a matter of how soon. We've been coming up on six years uh, of existence, and we don't have a use of force on our, on our unit which means we've never tased anybody, uh, we've never shot anybody, we've never hit anybody with an asp, but patients, talking to them, we get the result we want in the end and we don't have to force it on them. You want CIT to respond because you're going to get the help that you need rather than be sent to jail. The issues that police officers have with people who have mental illness is not unique to San Antonio. That's all over the country, all over the world. So any city that would decide to focus on this, put an emphasis on this, would certainly benefit from it. I no longer thought, what if they have to shoot Jeff? We save money, we improve public safety, and uh, people can get functional again. I mean, why wouldn't you do this? It's really uh, a no-brainer.